Hotep, everybody. This is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network and host of the African History Network show. It is Thursday, February 22nd, 2024, and African American History Month, Black History Month continues. And I've been getting questions on my social media platforms about my new 10 week online course that I teach on the weekend, usually on Saturdays, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach them in school. So I'm going to do a preview of that class, go over some of the slides in the class, deal with some of the content, and show you the extensive class outline, class lesson plan that I've put together. Okay, so the lesson plan is already done for all uh, 10 classes, and we did an introduction uh, back on uh, February 3rd. And the class started uh, February 10th. So our next class will be Sunday, um, special day, Sunday, uh, uh, February 25th, 2024. All right. Now, when we deal with the transatlantic slave trade, we have to understand that we can't start studying our history in slavery. We have to deal with thousands of years of history that leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. And we have the class lesson plan on on our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, so you can review the entire 10-week uh, uh, lesson plan. We have to deal with uh, thousands of years of history that leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place, and we have to deal with the 800-year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, who take the teachings from ancient Kem and ancient Egypt into uh, Europe. And these teachings bring Europe out of the dark ages. OK, so this class, um, I started teaching it in 2017. I've been studying history over 30 years. Uh, this class evolved out of a uh, four and a half hour lecture that I did back in January 2014. And uh, in this uh, 10 week online course, uh, there are over 200 slides that uh, I show you in the class that I put together. We look at 80 to 100 articles. Uh, there are 15 books that we reference. You don't have to buy any of these books to follow along in class. Uh, the video clips that I show you as well, interviews that I've done with many of our scholars, like Professor James Small, Professor Kabahai Wapi Kamene, uh, Renoko Rashidi, uh, et cetera, Dr. David M. Hotep also, okay? So this is a fantastic class. You can register for this class at our website. Um, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, class is on sale right now, $80. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. And in uh, class session number two, uh, we did a, uh, we looked at some history dealing with uh, African American History Month. We know February is uh, Black History Month, African American History Month, created by Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Uh, in February 1976, I mean, it's at February uh, 1926. It started February 7th, 1926. We know Dr. Carter G. Woodson was the co-founder of the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, uh, which is now the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, ASALA. We know he was a prolific writer. Um, he wrote numerous books. His most popular book, The Miseducation of the Negro, in 1933. And um, I also talked about this year's annual theme for uh, African American History Month, uh, which is um, African Americans and the arts, African Americans and the arts. OK, so we talked about that as well. Um, and there's been an annual theme for African American History Month since 1928 since 1928. So we went over this type of information uh, in uh, class number two uh, also, all right? So some of the things that we deal with in the class, and I'm going to uh, refer uh, back and forth from the class outline that I put together uh, to the uh, some of the slides in the course also, okay? So uh, be patient with me as, as we transition. Position uh, with uh, the, the origins of Black History Month and Dr. Carter G. Woodson. We talked about Dink Nash, um, which means you are amazing in Amharic. Uh, and this was Australopithecus afarensis, 
Uh, these remains at the time that they were found in Ethiopia in 1974 were the oldest remains of uh, of any human. This was a, a pre-human, was looked at as a pre-human. Australopithecus afarensis, her remains date back 3.2 million years. Uh, there's a global timeline of history that uh, we use in the class also that comes uh, from blackpast.org. So they have a good timeline of history. Uh, we talked about the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885, uh, where these European nations come together to divide Africa, uh, to, to continue to rape Africa of the mineral wealth. And so they can stop fighting and killing each other over the mineral wealth, uh, mineral wealth of Africa. So uh, we deal with some of that history. Uh, I talked about um, a little bit of the history of Juneteenth, June 19th, uh, 1865. Major General Gordon Granger uh, goes into Galveston, Texas. And there was a, a good article from the New York Times that dealt with how most Americans don't understand the history of Juneteenth. Now, this article came out in... Uh, uh, it was about June of 2021 when uh, this article came out. But it, sh it one of the things that um, people don't seem to understand, and this is why one of the reasons why it's so hard for us to get any type of reparative justice, any type of reparations, okay, any substantial type of reparations is because Americans are very ignorant of history, okay? Americans are very ignorant of history, regardless of race or ethnicity. So there was this good article uh, from the New York Times. Most Americans know little or nothing about Juneteenth, poll finds, and it found that 60% of Americans knew little or nothing about Juneteenth. And I would argue that most of what they think they know is false because Juneteenth was not the last day of slavery, okay? Uh, because June 19th, 1865, when Major General Gordon Granger uh, delivered General Order Number Three in uh, Galveston, Texas, and then he and his uh, troops of almost 2,000 uh, Union uh, Negro soldiers go all throughout Texas to bring Texas back into the Union. Okay, because Texas has seceded from the Union. Well, uh, the 13th Amendment is what legally. Uh, frees the slaves and what legally ends chattel slavery in this country. The 13th Amendment was not ratified until December 6, 1865, when Georgia ratified the 13th Amendment. OK, the Emancipation Proclamation did not free the slaves. That's January 1st, 1863. And uh, we in the class, we look at it um, and. I tell people to go to archives.gov and read the Emancipation Proclamation or go to um, loc.gov, Library of Congress website and read the uh the emancipation proclamation because it, it it specifically tells you that the uh territories that are in rebellion those territories that belong to the confederacy those slaves would be free if those territories did not come back into the union by january 1st 1863 but it gives exceptions it gives exceptions to the border states maryland missouri kentucky and delaware they were allowed to keep their slaves OK, Maryland did not abolish slavery until uh, November uh, 1864. OK, and that had to be put on uh, the ballot. They had to vote on that. The Emancipation Proclamation did not free the slaves. So one of the things that we do in this class from class number one is dispel a lot of myths that are out here dealing with history. OK, if you read, uh, this is an article that we look at in the class, the not quite free state, Maryland dragged its feet on emancipation during the Civil War. Now, this is from uh, Washington Post, September 13th, 2013. Interestingly, interestingly enough, September 13th is the day before September 14th, 1814, when Francis Scott Key wrote the defense of Fort McHenry, which was a, a poem that became known as the Star Spangled Banner. And you see the video that I did dealing with uh, the uh, Black National Anthem and the Star Spangled Banner, how Francis Scott Key was a white supremacist slave owner who thought that African people were mentally inferior and uh, how the Star Spangled Banner 
the whole song is a white supremacist song, not just the third stanza. OK, but the vote was uh, the final vote was thirty thousand one hundred and seventy four in favor of freeing the slaves to twenty nine thousand seven hundred ninety nine against November 1st, 1864. Maryland slaves were declared free only a few months before Congress would approve the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery. Now, this is almost two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. So there's a lot of this history in mainstream media that that I hear being repeated during Juneteenth, all this stuff that's just false. Now, Juneteenth is very important. It's very important that Juneteenth became a federal holiday. One, that's the only federal holiday that acknowledges slavery. OK, you do have uh, Emancipation Day, which is April 16th. OK, but that's uh, recognized. Not as much that's largely celebrated in Washington, D.C. Why is April 16th significant? April 16th, 1862, that's when the Compensated Emancipation Act of, of 1862 was signed into law by President Abraham Lincoln. It passed Congress, passed the House, passed the Senate. It was a bill sponsored by an abolitionist, Senator Henry L. Tyler, uh, out of Massachusetts. But this bill abolishes slavery in the District of Columbia, and slaveholders in the District of Columbia were paid reparations of up to $300 for each slave that they own, okay? And as uh, Tremaine Lee uh, on MSNBC talked about uh, uh, Thursday, February 22nd, 2024, on Alex Wagner's show, and he has a podcast dealing with reparations on MSNBC, uh, MSNBC's website and dealing with podcasts, you had a few, maybe five or six, African-Americans who owned slaves because they bought family members out of slavery in the District of Columbia and they collected on reparations also. Now, the slaves were never, th those slaves uh, that were freed were not given reparations. Uh, read this uh, article here from the, uh, this is from Senate.gov. Uh, the Zen Education Project has one, uh, but the one from uh, Senate.gov has more information, okay? Senate.gov is the official website of the U.S. Senate. Landmark legislation, the District of Columbia uh, Compensated Emancipation Act. So I hear people misstate what happened. And I hear people say, uh, I've been on panel discussions and, you know, I've been on, you see me on Roland Martin Unfiltered on Fridays. Uh, I've been on... Um, over it's been uh, over three years. I started October 20th, 2020 and been on almost every Friday since then. I, I hear people say, oh, slave owners were given reparations during slavery here in the U.S. The slaves weren't given anything. OK, this only applied to the District of Columbia. This is why we have to do more research. And this is why a lot of this stuff floating out here dealing with reparations. Um, don't take this the wrong way. A lot of this stuff. Uh, Senator Henry L. Wilson, I should say, Senator Henry Wilson. A lot of this stuff is not going to go anywhere. Because to if you're seeking a legal remedy to a historical problem, then that would imply that you understand both law and history. And unfortunately, a lot of the people pushing this stuff, dealing with reparations, don't understand either one. And I can listen to them and tell that. A lot of stuff is not going to go anywhere. They don't know how to make legal arguments. And the other thing is, as we deal within this class and we and, and also in the second class that I teach dealing with history from 1800 to 1968, race based policies are illegal at the federal level based upon Title six of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, Section 601, non-discrimination and fairly assisted programs. Nobody wants to have that conversation. OK, but if we look at this uh, very quickly here, landmark legislation, the District of Columbia Compensated Emancipation Act. On a visit to Washington, D.C. in 1836, the site of a slave auction held in the shadow of the Capitol, the U.S. Capitol, convinced future Senator Henry Wilson of Massachusetts to, quote, give all that to the cause of emancipation, end quote. So he's elected to the U.S. Senate in 1855. Uh, this is uh, this is five. Well, six years before the Civil War begins, April 12, 1861. 
uh, uh, Senator Henry L. Wilson became a leading voice for the abolition of slavery during the U.S. Civil War. OK, so make a long story short, uh, the bill passes, the House passes, the Senate. OK, and then um, the uh, President Abraham Lincoln signs it into law April 16th, 1862. The bill freed enslaved people in the District of Columbia and compensated slave owners up to three hundred dollars for each uh, free each person, you know, that they own that was being set free. Now, the Hartford Daily Current, C-O-U-R-E-N-T, celebrated that, quote, not a slave exists in the their shackles have fallen, never to be restored, quote. In the months following the enactment of the law, commissioners approved more than 930 petitions granting freedom to 2,989 formerly enslaved people. D.C. Emancipation Day, D.C. Emancipation Day has been celebrated in the District of Columbia since 1862. Just five months later, September 1862, uh, we know that that was the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, September 22nd, 1862. The Emancipation Proclamation was a military strategy that Lincoln used in the, 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 the purpose was to bring the South back into the Union. OK. All right. Now. So read this here at um, Senate.gov. Senate.gov is the official website of the U.S. Senate. So the 800 to 100, 880 to 100 articles that we look at in the class, we go deep into this history. OK, and in the second class that I teach uh, on Sundays, we have that class starting up in uh, June. Black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, Black Power Movement, 1800 to 1968. We focus in on that period of history um, and get deep, deep into this history also. OK. All right. Now, so we, we look at uh, things like uh, Juneteenth uh, briefly to dispel some of these myths. Uh, we talk about Imhotep, one of the greatest people who ever lived in human history. Imhotep was a, a philosopher. He was a priest, physician, architect, mathematician, designer of the Step Pyramid for Nasubiti. Uh, Pharaoh uh, Zosier in the third dynasty. And uh, Imhotep means he who comes in peace in the ancient Middle Nether language. And these are some famous statues of Imhotep. Now, this is Imhotep, and this is not Imhotep. In the uh, 2001 movie, The Mummy Returns, the villain's name was one of the villain's names was Imhotep. And they have this uh, eight, um, Arab looking Eurasian. Uh, actor Arnold Vosloo portraying Imhotep. And in the movie, he was a villain. He was evil. Okay. So many of our um, children will see this and think that one of uh, the, our greatest uh, ancestors was evil. Okay. And not even of African descent. This is a theft of the history, more cultural appropriation, a theft of the history. Here's a uh, picture of the step pyramid that uh, Imhotep was an architect of. Uh, this was uh, for the Subiti Zosia in the Third Dynasty. And there's a couple of books also uh, on Imhotep we reference in the class. This one right here by Dr. Malefe Keti Asante, who's a friend of mine. I just interviewed Dr. Asante. Um, in April of 2023, dealing with the whole uh, Cleopatra the Seventh controversy and the documentary that Jada Pinkett Smith did in the uh, series African Queens, the Egyptian philosopher, the Egyptian philosophers, ancient African voices from Imhotep to Akhenaten. Okay, excellent, excellent book. They talk about all these philosophers: Ptahhotep, Imhotep, Kagimni, San Chi, um, all these before Aristotle, Socrates, and Plato. OK, and uh, Imhotep, we see around 2700 B.C. he lives, uh, depending upon which timeline of history you look at. Um, the timelines of history can be 200 to 300 years off. But we know at least 130,000 years of our history um, has been stolen. OK, so I'm going to go back to the uh, course outline. And once again, the course, as I said before, the course outline, we have it right on the home page of our website. AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, uh, right at the top when you see the information for this class. So you can register for this class right now. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. 
you can go watch it. Uh, you can watch it anytime, even after the 10 week online course is over with, you can go back and watch the entire class. OK, so um, as soon as you register, you can watch the two previous classes and get caught up and join us Sunday, February 25th, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We go through and look at the different dating systems of BC and AD popularized by an English monk named the Venerable Bede. Uh, we look at the 1619 project. We talk about that some and how a lot of what we know, a lot of what we've been taught about 1619 is false. OK, and we go through and break that down. And then we deal with the date, uh, even though 1619 did take place, August 20th, 1619, 29 Negroes are on uh, or 29 Africans are on the White Lion pirate ship. OK, the White Lion pirate ship, which was an English pirate ship. Um, a lot of the history surrounding 1619 is false. And when we look at the work from Dr. David M. Hotel, who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence, and who, who was a friend of mine as well. We know he passed away in 2023. Uh, we see that African people have been in the land we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years. All right. Now, in 1619, uh, codified slave laws didn't, didn't, didn't even exist in any of the 13 colonies, codified slave laws. The first colony to have codified slave laws is going to be Massachusetts in 1641. Comes to Virginia around 1660. It hits the different colonies at different times. The, the uh, mistake that is made when we retell this history is we think this whole system of slavery exists in all the 13 colonies as soon as those Africans got off the ship. That's not the case at all. And if you read chapter two of Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr., this is the sixth edition, he lays out a lot of that history. And we see the way we think this history evolved is not actually how it happened, okay? Um, and that's why you have to study Bacon's Rebellion in 1675, 1676. But this is a historical marker here at uh, in uh, Point Comfort in, in Virginia. And there's a good article called Much of What We've Been Told About Virginia 1619 First Africans is Wrong. Uh, 1526 doesn't get talked about enough. And you had uh, the Spanish who were trying to set up a permanent settlement here uh, in the Georgia, South Carolina area. And they take 100 African slaves into that area in 1526. Those Africans are going to have a revolt and disappear. It's believed they went to go live with Native Americans. But this is 93 years before Jamestown, Virginia. How is it fixed? 1526 doesn't get talked about. But like I said, African people were here uh, for tens of thousands of years before uh slavery existed and we were here for thousands of years before the people who we call native americans came into existence if you read the first americans were africans documented evidence by dr david m hotel in his new book uh came out in late 2021 the first americans were africans revised and expanded uh on page 14 of his first book he lays out evidence from an archaeological discovery in 2004 by Dr. Albert Goodyear in Allendale County, South Carolina, that shows an African presence dating back at least 51,700 years ago. And they look at 13 pieces of evidence, 13 different types of evidence. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints and lava, Genetic M174D haploid group dealing with DNA and genetics, linguistics, painting, skulls, skeleton structures, and tools. They found, found 13 different types of evidence, categories of evidence that thoroughly documents an African presence dating back at least 51,700 years ago. Now, this is before Native Americans came into existence. Now, this is not to take anything away from Native American history, but we all know that African people were the first people on the face of the earth. One of the things we look at in the uh, class are archaeological discoveries. And there was an archaeological discovery coming out of uh, Morocco in June of 2017 that shows how um, they found Homo sapiens. Uh, they found remains of Homo sapiens that date back 300,000 to 350,000 years ago 
And this was found in Morocco. These are over 100,000 years older than the earliest remains that they had found of Homo sapiens sapiens or, homo, or modern man, Homo sapiens, that date back 195,000 years ago in Ethiopia. So the deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. So when these different archaeological discoveries come out, they have to keep pushing the timelines back. You know, Juvenile had the song, Back That Thing Up. When these archaeological discoveries come out, they keep having to back that thing up. They keep having to back the timelines up. And when you study a lot of these discoveries, the scientists are saying that now they have to rethink everything. These archaeological discoveries are pushing the timelines back. And they're, they're saying they have to rethink everything. So we've been led to believe that African people were the first people on Earth, but they went all around the world, but did not come to North America. That's a lie. That's a lie. And once the, we wrap our minds around the concept, and I'm going to go back to the cover of Dr. David M. Hotep's book, because this is this is one of the problems I have when we celebrate African-American History Month and don't understand history. If we approach history from the perspective that African people first came to this land that we call the United States of America, conquered and shackled in chains, conquered by Europeans. Then you are already starting the conversation with a defeatist attitude and a false concept. No, this was our land stolen from us. This was our land stolen from us. Once we wrap our minds around the concept, because the research has already been done, and you have European archaeologists like Dr. Albert Goodyear who tell the truth. Once we wrap our minds around the concept that this was our land stolen from us and we did not first come to this land conquered and shackled in chains, you would have a seismic shift overnight in the conscious level of African people in America. Now, this is not saying the transatlantic slave trade did not happen because you got some people out here that don't study history, don't study chronology history and say, well, because Africans were already here, that means transatlantic slave trade did not happen. That's false. All that stuff happened. We were just here tens of thousands of years before we were told that we came here. OK. And one of the things we do in the class, we look at where Christopher Columbus goes on his voyages. And Columbus never came to the land that we call the United States of America. That's another lie that's told. Columbus is crucial to understanding the expansion of the trans to understanding the expansion of the transatlantic slave trade, especially after Columbus dies in 1506. And then you have the Asiento de Negros, August 1518, signed into law by King Charles V, also known as King Charles I, which drastically uh, of Spain, which drastically expands the transatlantic slave trade. That's also as a result of Christopher Columbus and Bartolomeu de las Casas, right Reverend Bishop Bartolomeu de las Casas, traveling on the voyages, some of those voyages with Columbus, seeing the atrocities inflicted on Native Americans. And de las Casas uh, goes to the Pope and, and says that uh, they need to stop enslaving Native Americans and focus on saving the souls of Native Americans. And they needed to enslave primarily African people, secondarily white people. And this is what's going to happen. Now, he's going to quickly reverse course and regret that and fight for the abolition of slavery. But it's too late then. This thing is exploding. And the Spanish were the second ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade. Now, keep in mind, Columbus sails August 3rd, 1492, late in the same year that the African Moors lose control of their last stronghold, Granada, January 2nd, 1492. OK, the Spanish uh, Granada Wars. But when we look at the Khoisan, the Khoisan have the oldest DNA on the planet. The Khoisan are the short statured Africans that go all around the world. OK, and they were here in the land we call the United States of America. Now, an October 2012 genetic study published in Science Magazine found that the Khoisan in southern Africa are the oldest ethnic group of modern humans, the oldest ethnic group of modern humans with their ancestral line originating about 100,000 years ago. The Khoisan, formerly called by the derogatory term Bushmen, or also called Pygmies, another derogatory term, are genetically unique and no other currently known population 
had separated so early from our common modern human ancestor, according to the report. Now, these are two Khoisan women right here, okay? And short statute Africans, the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. Now, the Khoisan lived mainly in Southern Africa, territory spanning Botswana, Namibia, Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. They are largely divided into two groups, hunters and gatherers, or gatherers, known as the Sans people, and keepers of the livestock, known as the Khoi Khoi people. Now, Sarah Bartman, Sartre J. Bartman, Hottentot Venus, who was parade, who was the Nicki Minaj, the Cardi B, the Megan Thee Stallion of her time, because she was paraded around Europe and shown off in freak shows as a freak of nature. She had a huge, she had huge buttocks, okay? She suffered from uh, stetopegia, which is fatty deposits around the buttocks and thighs. She was a Khoisan woman. She had large breasts. And uh, she is going to die, it's believed, a suicide around 26 years old. And it's also believed that she became a prostitute as well. Okay. So you go study. Uh, and I actually did a video dealing with the history of Santa J. Bartman, who was Khoisan, who was Khoi Khoi. You see striking parallels between that, between her and Megan Thee Stallion, Cardi B, Nicki Minaj, Ruby Rose, uh, Sexy Red, Sukiyana. Um, except she was uh, sold into slavery doing it unwillingly. Today, we've been convinced to dehumanize ourselves for money and we do it willingly. Let that sink in. Now, the Khoisan languages include the distinctive click sounds, the click language, that are not found in the languages of their neighbors. There's a good article from AtlantaBlackStar.com called Five Ethnic Groups That Prove the First Humans Were Black. Five Ethnic Groups That Prove the First Humans Were Black. OK, so we go through and look at this history, look at archaeological discoveries, all different types of things like this and provide you with the evidence. OK, um, and if we go back here to the uh, course outline. And like I said, I've been teaching this class since 2017 and the course has evolved immensely since 2017. OK, and uh, here this is the first time that I've taught the class when I have the whole course outline completed up front and published as well. OK, so you all can check this out at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register for uh, this online class right now. The content is PG-13. You can use this information with your children uh, also. OK, um, we talk about the film Black Panther. The film Black Panther deals with African history, African culture, African language, African spiritual systems. There are 11 different African cultures that we see represented in the film Black Panther, but also the language spoken in the film Black Panther is a Bantu language called Isikosa, okay? Isikosa is a real African language, so we deal with that. Uh, and then we talk about uh, the skit from uh, the Richard Pryor show, 1977, where Richard Pryor is a uh, Egyptologist, uh, 1909, there's 1909 in uh, Egypt. And this deals with why the uh, history and culture, all, why all this was stolen. He comes across the book of Coming Forth by Day or what they call the book, uh, the book of life in the, uh, in the skit. Uh, so we talk about Bantu languages as well, like Kwanzaa is a Bantu language. And um, there's also a piece that deals with uh, Black Panther Wakanda Forever is Rich in Mythology. And it talks about the real life African and indigenous inspirations behind what we see in the film Black Panther. OK, um, one of the things I deal with early in the class is the term African-American. And we go through early on and dispel a lot of this misinformation that's floating around out here. A lot of people, and I don't know where this last started, but a lot of people are under the misinformation, uh, under the misimpression or misinformation that the term African-American was created by the Reverend Jesse Jackson. That's blatantly false. Now, we know 
Reverend Jesse Jackson, as well as other African-American scholars, reintroduced the term African-American in uh, the late 1980s, right around 1988, 1989. OK, but as I posted uh, on Facebook and I posted it again today, this is an excerpt from the book. Uh, Malcolm X speaks and we know we just commemorated the 59th anniversary of the assassination of Malcolm X February 21st 1965 um, in the Battle of the Bullet April 3rd 1964 when Malcolm delivers the Battle of the Bullet in um, Cleveland Ohio at Corey Methodist uh, Church he uses the term African-American and on page 36 uh, of this book in the battle of the bullet, he uses the term African-American. And what I'm going to do is um, let's see here. Let's throw this up. Let me try to expand this as much as I can. Let's look at this here. So here's the post. I also posted this on our fan page, um, the African History Network as well. Um, right here. Let's uh, let's go to this. OK, I said, for some reason, people are shocked when I tell them that Malcolm X used the term African-American in, in the speech, The Battle of the Bullet, April 3rd, 1964, in Cleveland, Ohio. For some reason, many people operate under a myth that Reverend Jesse Jackson created this, this term. He did not. Reverend Jackson re reintroduced the term. But since most of our people don't understand history, they fall for the myth. Uh, the pages referenced are from the book Malcolm X Speaks. It looks at some key speeches he made in 1963 to 95. I think it's also important to note Willie, uh, uh, Willie Lynch never historically existed. And the Willie Lynch letter 1712 has proven to be a fraud, which is true. Willie Lynch never historically existed. That's one of the biggest frauds in history. Research professor Manu Ampim, who's a friend of mine, I'm gonna, I'll be interviewing him sometime in late March 2024. Research Professor Manu M. Pim for more information on this topic. Uh, please note the term African-American is as old as. Uh, so read the article uh, from uh, NOLA.com. N -O um, the term African-American is as old as America itself. Sometimes reports. But when we look at this here, this is from pages 36 and 37 of the ballot or the uh, Malcolm X speaks the book Malcolm X speaks edited with prefatory notes by George Brightman and Malcolm says right now in this country if you and I 22 million African Americans that's what we are Africans who are in America you're nothing but Africans nothing but Africans in fact you get farther calling yourself African instead of Negro okay uh but check this out now also at blackpass.org and blackpass.org has thousands of pages about six thousand pages of articles dealing with african history and african-american history uh they have the transcript of the battle of the bullet speech and let me see which date is this because malcolm gave that speech a few times he delivered it april 12th 1964 in uh, Detroit, Michigan at King Solomon Baptist Church. But let me pull this up from Black Past. Uh, Cause I was just looking at it uh, a couple of days ago. And actually, do I have the link in here? Hold on, I thought I had the link. 
in one of these, I posted the link. Oh, there was a, a post I did dealing with um, uh, Malcolm commemorating his uh, the day of his assassination and I have the link to the Battle of the Bullet there. But let me pull this up right quick for you. This is at blackpass.org. I wanna I wanna show people this because once again, like I said, a lot of us don't understand this history. Okay, so this is at blackpass.org, 1964 Malcolm X, the Battle of the Bullet. This is the version from uh, yeah April 3rd, 1964 in Cleveland, Ohio. All right. And if we go here, right here, right now in this country, if you and I, 22 million African-Americans, that's what we are, Africans who are in America, okay? This is, this is Malcolm. We were using the term African-Americans in the 1960s. I don't know where this last started that Reverend Jesse Jackson created that term. Professor James Small, one of my teachers personally, he told me personally that he said we would call ourselves African-Americans in the 1960s. So let's, it, during African-American History Month especially, can we please like uh, expose these myths and, 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 and stop spreading these lies? Willie Lynch never historically existed. Jesse Jackson did not create the term African-American. African people did not first come here August 20th, 1619. Yes, August 20th, 1619 did happen, but we were here for thousands of years before that. Okay. All right. How you all like this type of information? Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on this broadcast. Who still needs to register for this 10-week uh, online history course that I teach? Normally, we do it on Saturdays. Um. 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or 5 p.m. Eastern Standard, 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, but I am speaking at a Black History Month celebration uh, that uh, my fraternity Phi Beta Sigma is doing along with our sisters, the Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. Uh, and it's going to be at, uh, it's this Saturday at Mary Grove College. So uh, I won't be able to teach the class on Saturday. So we're going to do a Sunday, February 25th. 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So you can register for the class right here. Just click right here, register here. And on the next page, just click on uh, enroll. And like I said, we have the class lesson plan here, lays out all 10 classes. Okay, so you can see the type of information that uh, we're going to cover. We have the uh, information to register for the class in the thread of the broadcast also. And I'm going to... Uh, Posted here uh, as well. Okay, yeah, class number three. And we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. So you can go back and watch this anytime, watch the classes anytime, even after the course is over with. Um, you'll still have full access uh, to the class. Okay, so you don't, you don't lose that. So a year from now, two years from now, you can go back and uh, watch the entire course. Okay. And I should change that. Uh, it's going to be next class. It's going to be um, Sunday, February 25th. Here we go. All right, let's continue here. Let's continue looking at here um, at the course outline. So you will never look at history the same way uh, once you take this class. This, this class is going to blow your mind. I guarantee it. All right. So we look at the term African-American and the earliest recorded uses of the term African-American goes back to 1782 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, I talk about the pyramid principle. OK, because when I teach. With two of my teachers, Dr. Linda Jeffries and Professor Teach, 
they uh, talk about the pyramid principle. And I, I use this in a lot of my lectures. And the reason why is it helps us uh, get a better understanding of how to use the history and culture. OK, it's more than just uh, speaking African languages, wearing African clothing, playing uh, uh, djembe drums, uh, eating African food, things like this. Right. So here's a picture of the uh, the Pyramid of Khafre at Giza. And a pyramid has three sides. At the foundation of the pyramid is African history and culture, okay? It's African history and culture that gives us our foundation, that gives us our values, our interests, and our principles, our VIPs, our values, our interests, and our principles. This gives us our self-esteem, our self-development, our self-worth. It gives us a cultural paradigm that we see reality through. In our history and culture, especially our history, teaches us about our accomplishments, our achievements, who we've been, where we've been, okay? Now, a people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. Now, it's that history and culture, that foundation, that influence our economic empowerment. It influences how we engage in economics our understanding of economics and what we do with our economics, what we do with our money, our $1.6 trillion GDP, gross domestic product that African-Americans have, influences the type of businesses that we have, the type of institutions that we build, but also how we engage in economics. Do we use white capitalism dressed up in red, black, and green and pass this off as black economics or black capitalism? Or do we understand the cooperative system, cooperative economics, the co-ops, which is based upon principles that we brought with us from Africa, okay? And when we study the Free African Society of 1787, we study the Colored Merchants Association in 1928. We study the Colored Farmers uh, Union of about 1886 in Texas. They're operating based upon the cooperatives where the members of these organizations are also owners and they work together to help one another prosper and survive. Uh, so these are ancient principles in different, it, every ethnic group in America use their history and culture to fight for scarce wealth, power and resources. And for African-Americans, we've largely been stripped of our history and culture. And we're trying to adopt European principles for business and European principles for economic empowerment, things like that, that largely don't work for us. We need to study these uh, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Black Wall Street, North Tulsa, because it was the true reformers uh, cooperative founded in 1881 that helped produce a lot of the prosperity that they had. OK, yes, oil was discovered there in the early 1900s. Yes, some of the early landowners got land because of the Black Freedmen Indian Treaties of 1866. That's true. I deal with all that history. But also you had cooperatives there also. OK, so when we study our history, we see a deep, rich history of uh, cooperative economics. So we, we deal with that to get a better understanding uh, of the cooperatives, okay? We talk about uh, Dr. David M. Hotel as well in the First Americans of Africans documented evidence. We look at archeological discoveries, like the one out of the Greek island of Crete in 2010, where they found stone tools on the Greek island of Crete that date back at least 130,000 years ago. But Crete has been an island for more than 5 million years. So they believe that those people had to have sailed there, okay? So these would have been African people, okay? And they believe that those people had to have sailed there, all right? Which puts, see, now, scholars like Renoka Rashidi and Dr. Charles Finch, they've been telling us for years that modern man is 300,000 years old as opposed to 75,000 to 100,000 years old. So we know at least 130,000 years of our history has been stolen. So these archaeological discoveries like this don't surprise me, but we deal with them in the class, okay? 
Uh, we talk about the Khoisan of Southern Africa have the oldest DNA on the planet. Um, there's a good article, Africa's oldest ethnic group fights to keep uh, ancestral land away from Amazon. Uh, we talk about Sarah Bartman. And then we look at the adultification, adultification bias in African-American girls. And how studies show that adults perceive, uh, studies show adults perceive African-American girls to need less nurturing and know more about sex than white girls at, at, a, at an earlier age. Need, need less nurturing and know more about sex than white girls at an earlier age. Where on earth, where in the world would they get something like that from? What, what, where would they get a stereotype like that from? Well, I don't know. I'll be damned. Could it have been passed down uh, for decades throughout history? Is that a holdover from slavery? When African-American women were sold into slavery as prostitutes and wet nurses? or just sold as breeders, okay? Where in the world could something like that come from? What could what could continue to perpetuate these negative stereotypical images and ideology that get projected onto African-American girls? I don't know. Now, Dr. Francis Cress Wilson, who I interviewed three times on the African History Network show, Dr. Wilson correctly told us that uh let me pull up this slide here she correctly told us she said we're the only people on this entire planet who have been taught to sing and praise our demeanment i'm a bitch i'm a hoe i'm a gangster i'm a thug i'm a dog if you can train people to demean and degrade themselves you can oppress them forever you can even program them to kill themselves and they won't even understand what happened. Now, unfortunately, I made the mistake of watching Megan Thee Stallion's performance at the Essence Festival 2023. Because on Hulu, if you have the Hulu streaming service, they had the Essence Music Festival prime time and they streamed it live on Hulu. They streamed it live on Hulu. So I saw the weekend, it started like 7 p.m. at night, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So I watched different performances. Uh, Trina performed. I saw Janelle Monet. I saw uh, Lauren Hill perform. I saw a number of different performances. Megan Thee Stallion came on. She was the last performance on Sunday. It was actually early Monday morning because she came on. I think she came on about 1 a.m., something like that. And go back and watch my videos where I talked about how horrific her performance was, the vulgar language, uh, the uh, ex sexually explicit language. And I saw Trina's performance, you know, the baddest B Trina, okay? You don't know Nan, Trina, that, you know, had the song with Trick Daddy. If you listen to Trina's lyrics in her performance and Megan Thee Stallion's lyrics, Megan Thee Stallion made Trina sound like Mother Goose. Megan Thee Stallion made Trina look like a Girl Scout. we think we're progressing in this area of the music no we're not we're regressing and and the music is being weaponized against us and too many of us don't understand history enough to understand the warfare that is being waged against us through the media through the music if you want to destroy a nation you do it through the music because the music hits the youth first and they're at least equipped to be able to fight back against it, to understand what's going on. Read the article from okplayer.com. India Ari criticizes Megan Thee Stallion and Janelle Monae for, sex, for sexual essence festival performances. 
also watch my critique of uh the song WAP by Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion, where I said they will only allow Negroes to put out music like this. They're not going to allow no top. They will never allow top Taylor Swift to put out a song like that because you only protect what you respect. You only protect what you respect. They will never allow a top white female artist to put out sexually explicit lyrics like that because they know it will bring about the mistreatment of white girls and white women. Now, yes. Is there some mistreatment of white girls and white women? Yeah. Ain't nothing like black women. Nothing like the mistreatment of black girls. And they know if you put out music like that, it justifies the mistreatment. That's why they only allow us to do that. I had somebody say, oh, but Madonna had lyrics. Yeah, show me lyrics from Madonna as sexually explicit as what? From Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion. They got 60 million views over the week, the first weekend that the video was released and uploaded to Cardi B's YouTube channel. He got 13 million views the first day. It was released on a Friday. That weekend, it got 60 million views. Show me something equivalent that white people are doing, sexually explicit like that, that blows up on social media like that. They don't do that because you only protect what you respect. They allow Negroes to do that because that's how they expect us to act because that's how we've been programmed. All right, now. So uh, class number three, we look at the uh, study done 130,000 years, the stone tools found on the Greek island, the Crete 130,000 years ago. We look at the, the lost, the two lost Egyptian cities that we'll look at in the class. One is Tanis Heraklion, which was discovered back in, well, it was revealed back in 2013, Tanis Heraklion, the lost city of Egypt. Uh, in uh, is believed that it, uh, it was it was it sunk into the ocean about 1200 years ago. The second one that we'll look at is called Dazzling Aten, and that was discovered just a few years ago. Dazzling Aten, uh, another lost city of Egypt. We'll talk about the 17 pyramids that were found buried underneath Egypt in 2011. And what you're going to find is you're going to have civilizations built on top of civilizations. And they use infrared technology, uh, infrared satellite that can look underneath the earth. And they discovered 17 pyramids buried underneath Egypt. OK, uh, another fantastic uh, archaeological discovery. Uh, so we, we look at also what are co-ops to get a better understanding of cooperative economics. So many people you know, talk about co-ops, but oftentimes they never clearly define what a co-op is. Now, Dr. Jessica Gordon Emhard probably wrote the best book, or at least one of the best dealing with co-ops. The name of her book is uh, Collective Courage. So we cite, this is one of the books we cite in the class. You don't have to buy any of these books to follow along in class. Collective Courage, A History of African-American Cooperative Economic Thought and Practice. And I interviewed Dr. Jessica Gordon Emhard back in 2014 because she was speaking here in Detroit. I interviewed her and in the book, she gives example after example of example throughout our history of us, of us using co-ops. And this is a part of history that is not talked about a lot. But what are co-ops? Um, the Black Cooperative Movement has always been parallel to the black uh, liberation and civil rights movement. We mostly heard about the political side of the movement, but you can't name a major black political leader that didn't point to cooperatives as a pathway to freedom. There's a good article, um, and this is, uh, this, this article right here probably I think was when I first found out about Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard before I did the interview with it, it's called Stop Saying Black People Don't Support Each Other Economically. This is from News1.com, uh, June 30th, uh, 2014. OK. And. As Dr. Francis Cress Wilson, um, we see. There was a resurgence 
of cooperatives during when COVID-19 hit, um, mutual aid networks find roots in communities of color. Amid the unfolding disaster of COVID-19 have been moments of generosity, whether it's people pulling together uh, support for college students who've been tossed out of dorms or collecting money to help restaurant workers street vendors and movie theater employees pay for their medicine, groceries, and rent. These mutual aid support networks in which communities take responsibility to care for one another rather than leaving individuals to fend for themselves have proliferated across the country as the pandemic turns lives upside down. The nonprofit organization Town Hall Project created Mutual Aid Hub to track all the various collective efforts when the coronavirus began its rapid global spread in March 2020. Back then, it counted only 50 mutual aid groups, but by May 2020, the number grew to more than 848 states. Driven by what the Hub's lead organizer, Shivani Desai, Desai, D -E -S -A -I, called a, quote, grassroots explosion of organizing, end quote, a grassroots explosion of organizing. Dr. Jessica Gordon Emhard, author of Collective Courage, said black mutual aid societies date back to the 1700s, like the Free African Society in 1787. Free black Americans pooled resources to buy farms and land, care for widows and children, and bury their dead, okay, and bury their dead. Many started credit unions, which is one of the oldest forms of cooperatives and still exist today. Credit unions, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated uh, gained a lot of media attention in 2023 for starting a credit union. Many started credit unions when banks would not serve them. Sociologist and civil rights leader Dr. W.B. Du Bois wrote about enslaved black Americans pulling money to buy each other's freedom. OK, so this is in our history and it comes from African culture. The African Union Society in Rhode Island was established in 1780 as the first black mutual aid society on record. Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhart said the second was the Free African Society, which was founded in 1787 in Philadelphia by Richard Allen and Absalom Jones. And it was founded to provide aid to freed slaves who were denied resources by white institutions. One of the most famous examples of mutual aid are the Black Panther, the Black Panther Party uh, survival programs from the late 1960s through which members distributed shoes, transported elders to grocery stores, offered breakfasts to children and more, okay? So this is in our history. Now, like I said, a people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. And what's happened is, is we've lost, largely lost that history. We largely don't know that history of how we were economically su successful in the past, even those who were free during slavery and how they, many of them are able to, were able to economically prosper, okay? All right, so let me continue. All right, um, so we talk about Dr. Jessica Gordon Nimhard. We talk about this um, discovery, this dealing with DNA, Y chromosome in uh, father of all humankind is 340,000 years old. Dealt with a man named Albert Perry in South Carolina who found his DNA traces back to an ancestor 340,000 years ago, about 338,000 years ago. Um, we're older than we thought. New find pushes human origin back 100,000 years. This is the article from NBCnews.com. All Now, when these archaeological discoveries take place, all the news outlets have these articles. NBC, ABC, CBS, MSNBC, CNN, NBC News. A lot of times, even Fox News has articles on this now on cable news you may only see 30 seconds to a minute if that but 
all these news outlets you go online they have articles on these archaeological discoveries we talk about the african presence in asia and in the khoisan sarah bartman sr j bartman uh, another discovery uh mastodon skeleton uh found in california dates back about 130,000 years ago and the paleontologists are saying that the skeleton was smashed apart and the way it was smashed apart it had to be smashed apart by humans okay now if that's true that puts an african presence in california 130,000 years ago okay um so we talk about the native africans uh the negritos who were the first inhabitants of the philippines um why the endangered african tribesmen in india shot dead an american missionary with an arrow all right that deals with the uh centalese in the uh, the adaman islands the centalese okay uh this is a uh remote group of africans in the adaman islands uh, we look at an article that dr renoko rashidi wrote of uh, the foreign enslavement africans uh ancient diaspora he wrote this article for atlantablackstar.com i interviewed renoko six times so I, I share an excerpt of an interview i did with renoko i think it may have been my last interview with him because we were trying to set up another interview before he passed away um inside egypt's three thousand year old lost golden city that's the other lost golden city of egypt that we uh lost city of egypt we look at the documentary uh global assignment the documentary on Renoko Rashidi, uh, Tony Browder's involved in that. So that has just been released. So that's showing in different uh, uh, cities. Uh, follow Tony Browder on uh, uh, Facebook for more information on that. Um, and then we talk about the judgment scene uh, coming out of ancient Kemet as well. Where we see the balance of the scales and the scales of Ma'at. Uh, by Enpu or Anubis, uh, Anubis, the jackal-headed deity. Uh, we look at an excerpt from the First Americans with Africans documented evidence dealing with the Omec, Omec heads in Mexico and the Mandinka Egyptian Omec connection. Um, there's an excerpt from the Rock Newman show, Black Egyptians Entered America 2,500 Years Ago. It was an interview he did with Tony Browder. And we deal with uh, way before Columbus, ancient Malayans from Mali sailed to the Americas. That was in 1311 AD. That was the year before Mansa Musa becomes emperor of the Mali Empire, which was 1312 AD. Okay. Uh, so we go through and we look at a timeline of history. We, we go through and look at these articles that deal with this, some ancient history to get a better understanding of how all this history evolves. We look at some ancient African civilizations. We talk about Kemet. Uh, Egypt, Nubia, uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, we go through and look at this history, okay? Ancient Nubia, founded around 4,500 BCE, which is the mother of Kemet, mother of Egypt, the first monarchy in recorded history. We talk about a little bit about the Kandakis and Amana Shikito, Queen Amana Shikito. Um, Egypt on the Pony Browder is a fantastic book, book and we spend some time looking at that as well egypt on the potomac because egypt on the potomac deals with how the layout of washington dc is based upon uh uh based upon the layout of ancient kemet ancient egypt all right and many of the founding fathers referred to uh washington dc as egypt of the west okay egypt of the west so when we look at the Washington Monument, that's 555 feet tall. The Washington Monument is a copy. It was actually a, a, a ancient African symbol of resurrection called a Tekken, coming from the story of Asara, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. And there were about 1,200 Tekkenu all throughout ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, okay? Today, they're only, uh, they're less than 12 today. Today, they're less than 12. 
So we see a picture here of a Tekken new or a Tekken for singular, Tekken new for plural. Uh, we see this here in Egypt and we see that they've been taken to other cities around the world. Tekken new from ancient Egypt taken to cities around the world. London, England, New York City, Paris, France, as we see the ones here. There's a good article from face to face Africa.com called Cleopatra's Needle, how three ancient Egyptian obelisks ended up in New York City, London, England, and Paris, France. And in this, an excerpt of the article says, ancient Egyptians called obelisks Tekkenu. Now you will see Tekkenu spelled a few different ways. And they were also used to tell the time in the past. They were also used to tell the time in the past. Their pinnacles were basically covered in gold to reflect the sunlight. Historians say that obelisks represented immortality and eternity and their long structure helped connect the heavens and the earth. Currently, Cleopatra's Needle is the name given to three ancient Egyptian obelisks, one in New York City, one in London, England, one in Paris, France. However, they do not all come from one Egyptian site. OK, um, they uh, the obelisks in New York and London are carved out of red granite from the quarries of Aswan, a major source of stone for Egyptian antiquities. The two obelisks were commissioned by uh, commissioned by Nesubiti or Pharaoh Thutmose the third for the temple of the sun of in Heliopolis near modern day Cairo with each weighing about 224 tons and 68 feet tall. Okay. So this is African culture taken around the world, but most of us don't associate it with Africa. We associate it with the people who are in those areas where it's taken. We think it's something that white people created. Oh, the Washington Monument. That's named after George Washington. We think it's something white people created. But the foundation of Freemasonry are the teachings from the ancient Egyptian mystery system, okay? Now, here's a famous statue of Asar Aset and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Asar, the father, is in the middle. And in the class we deal with, Heru being born of a virgin birth on December 25th. And where all this, a lot of stuff comes from, okay? So that gets recycled and reinterpreted through various people's cultures over thousands and thousands of years. There were approximately 1,200 Tekkenu or obelisks built in ancient Kemet, but only about a dozen are found today or less than a dozen are found today in Egypt. Many of the Tekkenu removed from Egypt are now in Istanbul, Turkey, London, England, Paris, France, Berlin, Germany, New York, New York, New York City, Rome, Italy, Vatican City, and elsewhere throughout the world. The Tekkenu are now called obelisks by their new owners, and few know their origin or that they symbolize the resurrection of the African king, Asar. Now, this is from page 17 of Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. Tony's a friend of mine. I just interviewed Tony. That was March of 2023. We talked about the, um, the importance of uh, Nile Valley uh, civilization history. Okay. That interview got about well, over 50,000 views on our YouTube channel. My YouTube channel is Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. You can go check out that interview. This is a copy of Egypt on the Potomac right here. Just bear with me because I have books all over the office. I need to get a, another bookshelf. This is Egypt on the Potomac right here. This is one of the books we use in the class. Once again, you don't have to buy any of these books. We show you excerpts on the screen. But... This is an excellent book to get. Egypt on the Potomac, as well as Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder. Okay. Now, when we look at Freemasonry, because we, we have to look at Freemasonry, we'd look at that in the class. 
in the relationship to ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet, the Nile Valley region of Africa. The word Mason is derived from uh, the Latin words mass and son, mass and son, S-O-N. Mason means child of light and expresses the desire to pursue light, which is a metaphor for the sun, which symbolizes knowledge. The term child of light or sons and daughters of light was first used to identify students who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet. Many Masonic temples were modeled after the temples of ancient Kemet, places where light or knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees. So the, the whole concept of going to institutions of higher learning and getting your credentials in a series of degrees, associate's degree, bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD, that whole concept comes out of ancient Kemet in the ancient Egyptian mystery system, the, the, out of the temples where they went to study for 42 years. The concept of liberal arts, okay? And in, in uh, a Stolen Legacy by George G.M. James, he talks about the, the seven liberal arts and the arithmetic and the logic and things like this. Uh, he talks about the uh, uh, quivium and the quadrivium, uh, the uh, trivium and the quadrivium, I think it is. But he, uh, all that comes out of the Nile Valley region of Africa. We associate most of this stuff with Europeans. They learn from us. They learn from us. This is why, if you've seen any of my information dealing with the fight for what people call reparations, reparative justice, my whole concept of reparations as a historian is much different than a lot of this stuff floating around the reason why first of all you have to understand uh the root concept of reparations means to repair to make you whole again to restore you to a state before the damage that was was done to repair a harm that was done okay if we're talking about repairing the damage done to African Americans. You first have to analyze who African people were and what African people had before they were put into an institution of slavery that largely stripped us of our history, culture, language, spiritual systems, folklore, mores, family ties, nationality, okay? Cosmology. Cosmology deals with the understanding of the universe as an orderly system. Cosmogony. Cosmogony deals with the understanding of the origins of the universe, and that's based upon people's culture. You have to analyze who we were before we were put into the institution of slavery and what we had. If you want to talk about repairing the damage of something. If you start the if you start the conversation with us already enslaved, stripped of those things, that means you don't understand that you don't understand. This is why trying to equate reparations with cash payments only, and you think you can repair that damage with just cash payments, and you're going to give a people who've been stripped. Who, who most of us still hold the, the last names of our former slave masters and have been taught to hate ourselves, who have been psychologically damaged. If we all got a million dollars a day, white people will have it all back by this time next week. And you haven't repaired the damage because you haven't properly assessed the harm that was done because you don't understand the history. Very few people want to be honest enough and say this. I don't give a damn. I'll tell you the truth. I'm not trying to raise money for the next reparations conference. I can tell you the truth. Secondly, you have to understand the history of the laws and policies put in place that inflicted the harm in the first place. This is why the California Reparations Task Force, the final report that came out June 29, 2023 is so important. That 1,000 page report 
that that lays out 12 harms okay and lays out 115 policy recommendations this is why that's so important because they are looking at fairly analyzing the damage that was done okay and they're talking about remedies for the damage that was done this goes way beyond cash payments people operate based on people haven't i can listen to people tell they haven't done the research so they just equate the damage that was done to cash payments. no you don't understand the history so my kwanzaa presentation i did december 27 uh 2023 at King Solomon Baptist Church, I talked about some of this. And I'm going to go to, let me see, let's pull this up. Um, Let's go to this. I want to show this quickly here. Because most people haven't even re haven't read the um, executive summary. You read the seventy four page executive summary, you get a much better understanding of this. I've read the executive summary. I read the I read the executive summary of the initial report, the five hundred page report. The California report highlights a history of moral and legal wrongs. Over thirteen chapters and about five hundred pages, the interim reports. Authors recount the moral and legal wrongs the American and Californian governments have inflicted upon their own black citizens and residents, noting how slavery and subsequent discrimination have exposed black, black communities to racial terror and political disenfranchisement, left them with inferior outcomes in health and wealth building, and neglected them and relegated them to segregated neighborhoods and, and schools. Now, California became a state in the Union in 1850. When they became a state in the Union, they abolished slavery. Now, historians have identified at least 1,500 people who were in some type of semi-slavery state or status. Some people put the number at 4,000. California was not Texas. In June of 1865, when Major General Gordon Granger goes into Texas to deliver General Order Number Three, which we commemorate during Juneteenth, there were 250,000 enslaved Africans in Texas. California is not Texas. California's history is totally different than Texas. But the but the reparations reactionaries haven't studied the history, so they think California is the same as Texas and Mississippi, Alabama. No. But California does have a, a deep history of racism, okay? Racism, segregation, redlining, housing discrimination, political disenfranchisement, etc. So they lay out twelve harms here, uh, here in their uh, final report. Well, in the in the interim interim report and the final report, one enslavement, two racial terror, three political disenfranchisement, four housing segregation, five separate and unequal education. Six, racism in environment and infrastructure, okay? Seven, pathologizing the black family. Eight, control over creative, cultural, and intellectual life. That deals with our royalties being stolen from us in like the music industry, okay? That's what that's talking about. Nine, stolen labor and hindered opportunity. 10, an unjust legal system. 11, mental and physical harm and neglect. 12, the racial wealth gap. So then they go through and they show how laws and policies at the federal level harmed African-Americans across the country. And then specifically how laws and policies, similar laws and policies in the state of California harmed African-Americans. So there were 115 policy recommendations are designed to repair that damage or at least begin to repair that damage. That's the result of the 12 harms. That's the result of laws and policies. It was laws and policies that put us in this predicament. It's going to be laws and policies that take us out, take, take us out of this. This goes way beyond a check. Because once you spend the money, the laws and policies are still in place. 
inflicting the harm. You haven't scratched the surface. This is what a lot of people don't understand. Now, ideally, some form of cash payments can be part of a comprehensive reparations package. Ain't no one in the hell. Understanding history and law, no one in the hell reparations should just be cash payments. You're not going to repair anything. And by this time next week, white people have most of that back. And the only thing you've done is stimulated their economy. And those laws and policies that continue to inflict the harm, that maldistribute wealth, wealth power and resources, those historical, those structural inequities, they will still be there. They haven't changed. But Amazon, the Amazon website will crash every 10 minutes. The Mercedes-Benz showrooms will be empty. But the health disparities, uh, maternal uh, 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 maternal deaths of African-American women, three times more likely to die during pregnancy or pregnancy-related deaths, that'll still be there. When you look at us being dis discriminated against, when you look at the, uh, the values of our homes and valued at uh, $48,000 less, than comparable white homes, which is a collective $156 billion as the Brookings Institute uh, documented a few years ago, that'll still be there. So we have to understand comprehensive reparations, but first you have to analyze, you have to study the history of what happened. Uh, the And this is the interim report right here. This is the executive summary from the interim report. Just Google California Reparations Task Force. It will come up. And then I have the link here also. Uh, you can go to Rob bon, um, OAG.CA.gov, Office of Attorney General oag.ca.gov um that's rob bonta in california just search for the california reparations report because they have the final report right here and then you can read the full final report you can look at the executive summary it's broken up into chapters all of that Okay, give us a thumbs up, give us a like, give us a heart on this broadcast. Be sure to register for this 10-week uh, online history course that I teach ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understand the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. So we talk about uh, Egypt on the Potomac. Um, I saw an interview that Tony Browder did on News One Now with Roland Martin back in uh, 2015 we talk about Abub abubakari the second coming to the americas also um in uh, 1311. let's see class number six we deal with the african origins of star wars and the asarian drama the story of asar aset and heru who the greeks called osiris isis and horus and how George Lucas, father of um, Star Wars, had a mentor named um, Joseph Campbell. And Joseph Campbell wrote a book called The Power of Myths, or The Power of Myth. And Joseph Campbell taught him about all these myths. One of those myths was about Asar, Aset, and Heru. Uh, we look at excerpts from Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder and uh, deal with the story of Asar, Aset, Heru, and the Virgin Birth. Heru being born on December 25th to the Virgin Aset. Uh, we talk about Benjamin, Benjamin Banneker as well and the surveying of Washington, D.C., the Dogon tribe of Mali and Burkina Faso, who discovered the invisible star centuries before uh galileo invented, invented the telescope they talked about the series uh a and series b star systems 
we look at an excerpt of an interview I did with Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene dealing with the African origins of Star Wars and the Asarian drama. Um, talk some about Queen Tia, of the 18th dynasty, the wife of Amenhotep III, mother of Akhenaten and grandmother of uh, Pharaoh or Nesubiti, uh King Tut, Tut Ankhamen. The relationship between Memphis, Tennessee and Memphis, Egypt. Talk about the Druids in uh, Ireland and how the Druids were practicing a watered down version of the teachings from ancient Kemet, from ancient Egypt. And the Druids being killed by uh, a British slave named Patrick, who became canonized as a saint. So in class seven, we talk about Hannibal Barker, and we know that um, Denzel Washington is going to portray uh, Hannibal Barker, the Carthaginian general. Uh, in a movie uh, directed by um, Antoine Fuqua, director Antoine Fuqua. I did a, a video about that. So we talk about Carthage. And this is, Carthage is one of those uh, African empires that Europeans try to claim as their own. So, and we do a, a Hannibal Barker, Publius Cornelius Scipio in the Battle of Zama 202 BC. We talk about the Battle of Canine 216 BC, one of the greatest military victories in history, where uh, Hannibal defeats the Roman army. The Roman army has about 80,000 men. Hannibal has 50,000. He's one of the greatest military strategists in history. And we deal with why Africa was not named after uh, Publius Cornelius Scipio. Because he takes the surname Africanus, and Africanus is Latin, means belonging to Africa. He takes the surname Africanus after he defeats Hannibal Barca at the Battle Battle of Zama in 202 BC. So once again, we have that whole history backwards. Um, we talk, we look at the relationship between the teachings coming out of the Nile Valley region of Africa and the the, the development of European secret societies. Um, we look at Joie de Piet, Black Pete, who was a Moor and was the sidekick to center class, um, St. Nicholas. And this is the precursor to Santa Claus. This is the precursor to Santa Claus. This is where, um, St. This is where Santa Claus comes from with the red and white outfit comes from Bishop Nicholas right here so there's a whole backstory to this myth also so we deal with that uh, let me pull up the slide so we deal with this also in the class because this shows the it continues to show the influence of the African Moors and in the Netherlands uh, in early November there's a they celebrate um center class and Joie de Piet coming to the Netherlands, coming on a steamboat from Spain, coming on a steamboat from Spain. And we know it was the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, where the Moors go in in 711 AD, led by Tariq Ibn Ziyad, and they're gonna uh, the Moors are gonna conquer the southern portion of Spain. All right, so let's go back to the um, course outline. So we look at what is a patron saint and what is, the, what is the relationship between patron saints and Christianity and the Netaru in ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. Queen Charlotte Sophia, who was of African Morris ancestry on her, wife, on her mother's side, and she was the wife of King George III, who was the king of England during the American Revolutionary War. This is who the 13 colonies are revolting against uh 16 uh well i'm sorry um six, uh, 1775 to 1783 the american revolutionary war war we look at who were the moors and look at some of the history of the moors in europe Tariq ibn Ziyad invading europe uh invading the iberian peninsula 711 a.d uh we look at uh saint maurice as well who was a moor and the painter say the germany 
Why are African Moors heads on the national flags of Corsica and Sardinia? This is some more information uh, showing the um, history of the Moors and the, and the presence of the Moors in Europe, these African Moors heads. Because uh, the Moors were there in Corsica and Sardinia, and it took a monumental effort to defeat them. So they're right on the national flags of these um, island nations. All right, going back to the uh, course outline. So class number eight, we look at um, how did the Moors lose power in Spain? Uh, and one of the books we reference is Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. I have that book around here somewhere. Oh, right here. Golden Age of the Moor. One of the best books dealing with the uh, history of the Moors in during the medieval time and in Europe, Golden Age of the Moor, edited, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay is one of the baddest scholars on the history of the Moors. He has a, a essay in here. Renoko Rashidi has an essay in here as well. So we talk about the Crusades some and the first Crusades, 1096 uh, AD. Who were the Knights Templar? Be, and that's in, the Knights Templar are important because they were taught by the African Moors. And they learn some of the teachings from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, become very powerful. OK, uh, we look at excerpts from Christopher Columbus in the African Holocaust, Slavery and the Rise of European Capitalism by Dr. Uh, John Henrik Clark. Because, like I said, Columbus is crucial to understanding the expansion of the transatlantic slave trade. OK, and we look at where Columbus goes on his uh, four voyages. He never comes to the land that we call the United States of America. The closest he comes here is Cuba, which is 90 miles away, about 90 miles away. Uh, if we look at this here, let's look at this here. Uh, where's Columbus? Oh, that's the wrong one. Right here, Cristobal Colon. Cristofaro Colombo. Okay. Um, when we look at where he goes on his four voyages, and if you go to history.com, official website of the History Channel, and just search for uh, Christopher Columbus, it will show you where he went. He never came to the land we call the United States of America. August 3rd, 1492, he sets sail. That's his first voyage. He sets sail on the Nina de Penta and the Santa Maria. He goes into the Bahamas, which he calls San Salvador. He goes into Cuba and Hispaniola. We know the western third of Hispaniola is where the island of Haiti is, but all that was a Spanish colony first. And in 1697, the French are going to take over the western third of the island of Hispaniola. And uh, they're going to name it St. Dominique. But those Africans are going to have a revolt. OK, and call it Haiti, which we call Haiti. Um, second voyage. September 1493 goes into the West Indies and Boricuan, uh, Puerto Rico, at which we call Puerto Rico today. It goes into Jamaica, 1494, conquers all that territory. Third voyage, May 1498, Trinidad and Venezuela mainland, South America. Fourth voyage, May 1504, he goes into Panama and Honduras and Central America, conquers all that territory. They're going to set up plantations, especially sugarcane plantations. The early, uh, about 1501, 1502, they start taking Africans into those territories and enslaving them. So this is a deep history. And your understanding of politics is directly related to your understanding of history. So when you start getting to this history, especially looking at Spain, things like this, and, and what Spain conquered, 
then you start getting a better understanding of what's going on today, especially in the second class that I teach um, that deals with history from 1800 to 1968. Okay, and then we look at the, the Portuguese are the first ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade starting in 1441, okay, when they go into what's modern-day uh, Mauritania. So class number nine, uh, we look at the Doctrine of Discovery, Dom, Dom de Versus, 1452. Uh, what is the Papal Bull amongst the Catholic Church? The Treaty of Tordesillas, June 7th, 1494. Where the, Pope, the Pope divides the non-Christian world between Spain and Portugal and, and tells them to go out and conquer the non-Christian world. Uh, we look at the uh, Spain begins to take African slaves into uh, the Caribbean islands around 1502. King Charles V and the Asiento de Negros. Okay, King Charles V and the Asiento de Negros of 1518, because you can't understand the expansion of the Atlantic slave trade without understanding the Asiento. And oftentimes people talk about the transatlantic slave trade and don't mention the Asiento. Okay, that's Spain. And this was a, a, a license that the Spanish crown gave to slave traders to supply Spanish colonies with enslaved African people. What was the middle? We look at what was the middle passage of the transatlantic slave trade um, to get a better understanding of that. And there was an essay that Dr. Maleficetti Asante wrote in 2010, re, 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 uh, rebuking and refuting Dr. Henry Lewis skipped the truth gates, as one of my teachers, Dr. Leonard Jeffrey, calls him, because oftentimes he skips over the truth. Dr. Henry Lewis Gates Jr. And it deals with Gates is wrong about the African involvement in the slave trade because Gates wrote this op-ed for the New York Times in 2010 called Ending the Slavery Blame Game. And he makes the false argument that, Af that Africans were as equally culpable for the transatlantic slave trade as Europeans, which is totally false. That's a lack of understanding of history. So this is an excellent article by uh, Dr. Maleficetti Asante who coined the term Afrocentricity back in the 1980s. Uh, we look at the role of insurance that, that insurance companies pay, played in slavery. When did the first African uh, come to America that we know of by name? That was probably Juan Garrido in 1513 in Florida. Comes into Florida with the Spanish conquistador Juan Ponce de Leon. Bacon's Rebellion in 1675-1676 in Virginia and how it planted the seeds of race-based slavery, but also planted the seeds of racism that we still see evident today. To understand what's going on today, you have to understand Bacon's Rebellion. You understand Bacon's Rebellion and those uh, that, that, that uh, group of about 500 rebels who were being exploited on the uh, uh, tobacco plantations in Virginia, and how they uh, unite, you have uh, enslaved Africans, free African-Americans, um, white indentured servants, poor whites, and they will, they realize that they were all being exploited by the same people, okay? And they had a rebellion in, in December of 1675, they burned down the town of Jamestown, Virginia. December 1675, they burned down the town of Jamestown, Virginia. Okay, now I don't know if this was the inspiration for the song, The Roof, The Roof, The Roof is on Fire. We don't need no water, you know, but it very well could have been. And there's a good article from Britannica.com, the history of the idea of race, the history of the idea of race. On September 19, 1676, Nathaniel Bacon and his followers returned to Jamestown, Virginia and battled forces. Uh, let me see, that was uh, September. It was in December 1675 where they burned down the town of Jamestown, Virginia. 
But this is a deep history here. We deal with uh, did African Americans own slaves and why? Because oftentimes we were buying uh, family members out of slavery. Okay. You did have some people to take advantage of that, but uh, when Dr. Carter G. Woodson did his research uh, on this, he looked at 1840, I think it was, 1840, and he found that almost 50% is estimated that 50% uh, of African Americans that owned slaves, they were buying family members out of slavery. We saw this in Washington, D.C. also. Uh, when we dealt with the Compensated Emancipation Act, of April 16th, 1862. Uh, we deal briefly with the fake Willie Lynch letter, 1712, uh, the tragedy of the Lusden uh, slave ship, January 1st, 1738. And look at the origin of negative images in the media and how they're rooted in slavery and minstrel shows. Okay, that's class 10. So this is, like I said, this is a... Um, a class where we get deep into the history. You never, never look at history the same way. There's over 200 slides that we look at, slides that I put together myself, 80 to 100 articles. Um, video clips, all of that. Excerpts of books. So join us, uh, class number, uh, normally we do the class on Saturday. Saturdays, but I'm speaking at a Black History Month celebration this Saturday. So we're going to do the class Sunday, February 25th, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, register for the class right now. Click right here to register. And you can watch the two previous classes because they're archived. And we have the lesson plan here also. You can check that out, like I said, and join us in class for our next class. There's a preview right here also that you can look at. And follow us on our social media platforms. Click right here, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, uh, X or Twitter. Listen to the African History Network show, Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We broadcast on Facebook and YouTube. Click right here for our audio podcast. And the uh, you can, we have our... Um, 15 lecture bundle pack in digital download format. 15 of my lectures. African History Awakens the African Mind for Mental Death. We have it on DVD also. Okay. But that's on sale, uh, $75. So you can click there and it has the information, tells you which lectures are in the bundle pack uh, as well. If you want to support the African History Network, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. This is our official Cash App tag. Dollar sign the AHN show, S H O W. These other ones here are fake African History Network Cash App accounts that I'm still trying to get shut down because they've been stealing money from us. I don't know who set these up. There's a total of five out there I've, that I've identified that are fake. So that's why I created um, this graphic and we have the link right here for Cash App. When you click on it, it shows our Cash App tag. So this helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, pay some of the bills, et cetera. And here's our link for um, PayPal also, okay? All right, so look, hopefully you learned a lot today. Register uh, for this course. You can use this information with your children. Like I said, the content is PG-13. It's not overly graphic. I don't do a lot of cursing or anything like that. But you're going to learn so much in this class. This is a great time of the year to start learning this history and take this information with us throughout the year. Okay. All right. So uh, thanks for joining us today. Share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network. A YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel, my Instagram page, um, The AHN Show, or other social media platforms. Remember, right knowledge corrects wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you.